okay again. So I'd like to now share with you a little bit briefly the Advent devotion for this evening. And uh, first of all, it's going to be based off of Isaiah chapter 37 and reads as follows, starting at 33. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, <clears throat> nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same way shall he return, and he shall not come into this city, says the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. But when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpse. So Zanacharim, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt back in his capital city of Nineveh. So there is the text. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, O oh Lord, we ask your blessings upon the meditation of your word this evening. As we are under siege, uh, back in the Old Testament, they were under siege by the Assyrians, were under siege by this uh, pandemic. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would enable us to have the faith of Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah in your promises of deliverance and of protection uh, through all of these things. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Well, imagine yourself in the city of Jerusalem in the year 701 BC. The city is a bustling, fairly large and well-known city in the ancient Near East. Archaeologists estimate that it's about 150 acres in size. The temple is there, uh, the temple built by King Solomon over 250 some years ago. Outside of Jerusalem in Judah is the presence of a terrifying and menacing Assyrian army. You go through the history of world powers, and uh, Israel was the top of the line, but eventually Assyria became the king of the world, and then Babylon becomes the king of the world, the Medes and Persia become the king of the world, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. <clears throat> so during this time, the Assyrians are top dog, and they love to shove their weight around. So the kings of Assyria have conquered the surrounding lands, including the northern kingdom of Israel. The two country, the people of Israel have been split because of the rebellion against God. <clears throat> you had the north and you had the south and they had civil wars between them just like we did in our country in the 1860s. And uh, the north was already taken out by Syria and brought into exile. So now Assyria was setting its sight on the southern kingdom called Judah and surrounding the capital named Jerusalem. So Zanacharim is the king of Assyria at this time. He's already destroyed 46 towns of Judah and deported over 200,000 people of the people of Israel. He's taking no prisoners. So now he wants Jerusalem to surrender to Assyrian rule. The surrender would be a less of a bother for him rather than to have to carry out a military attack and go to all the fuss of destroying the city's walls. It'd be just simpler if Jerusalem just surrenders. So Akram was currently in the process of destroying in a neighboring city called Lachish over there. There's a prominent city of Judah located west of Jerusalem. In order to pursue Jerusalem to surrender, Zanacharim sent uh, his high-ranking official called Rabshakeh uh, to talk to the people unto surrendering. Well now, <clears throat> King Hezekiah believed in Yahweh, the God of Moses and the prophets, the God of Isaiah, the God whose temple was there in Jerusalem. Earlier when Hezekiah had been seriously ill and near death, he prayed to Yahweh and Yahweh heard his prayer. The episode is recorded in Isaiah chapter 38. Yahweh promised to give Hezekiah 15 more years of life. And he made this promise. I will deliver you in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. King Hezekiah, the king of Jerusalem, believed that promise from the true God. Hezekiah believed the promises he was taught. The promises of Isaiah the prophet 
And King Hezekiah told the rest of Jerusalem about this promise. Now, the Assyrian official was trying to undermine confidence in that promise. So again, imagine yourself back in 701 BC being a citizen of Jerusalem. You got this Assyrian army surrounding your city and uh, they are threatening to destroy it and telling you that the God of Yahweh cannot deliver. So you're living under the rule of King Hezekiah. Uh, the speech of the Assyrian envoy, Rabshakeh, uh, is recorded in Isaiah chapter 36 and 37. We're going to listen to some of the arguments of Rabshakeh to try to convince the people just to surrender so they wouldn't have to go under a long siege and destroy the city. So he, he did his homework about the God of Yahweh. He, he tries to undermine confidence in the promises God has given his people. His goal, again, is to persuade them to surrender, to come out willingly. Will we surrender or will we believe the promises of deliverance? That we've been taught. Will you believe the promises that you were taught from this pulpit Sunday from Sunday? Will you believe the promises you were taught in your Sunday school? Will you believe the promises you were taught in your catechism classes and confirmation classes? Will you believe the promises that you were taught in adult Bible class? Will you believe in the promises that you were taught every Sunday through the liturgy and prayers and hymns? Will you believe the promises of God? Or is the world just seemingly to be too strong for God to win? Will you surrender to the voices of the world? Will you become a Christian in name only, whose mind and heart are shaped by the voice of the world more than by the Lord's voice? You know, we are all flooded by the world's voices every minute of every day. They come to us 24-7 via television, radio, our computer screens, our phones in many countless ways. Many Christians simply end up conforming to the world and its way of thinking. Many Christians basically surrender to the Rav Shakaz, the Assyrian officials. Will you surrender? Or will you believe in God's promise to save his Zion? Let's listen to the Rav Shakaz speech. He's trying to undermine confidence in the claims made by King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah tells Jerusalem to trust in Yahweh, the God of Israel. Our God promised to deliver Jerusalem, his city, his Zion, from the king of Assyria. But uh, Rabshakeh claims that that's all a bunch of nonsense. Rabshakeh says to Jerusalem, you are no match to the might of Assyria. If you rely on Egypt, that country down in the south, they're not going to help you. They're a broken reed. Don't look for them to come and save you. They're not able. If you think your own military prowess can deliver you, the king of Assyria will give you guys 2,000 horses if you can ever have enough horsemen to ride them. No, they were pretty arrogant, these Assyrians. The Assyrian official speaks to the city of Jerusalem. Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in Yahweh by saying Yahweh will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. Beware lest Hezekiah mislead you by saying Yahweh will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria so far? Where are the gods of Hamoth and Arpad? Where are the gods of Zephyrim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands has delivered their land out of my hand? That Yahweh would deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. Rabshakeh mocks the promises of Isaiah and King Hezekiah. He mocks their faith. He says, wake up, Zion. Resistance is futile. Your gods no match to the overpowering, unstoppable might of Assyria. The king of Assyria has already conquered countless other cities. Their gods are no match. None of their gods were able to deliver them. What makes you think your God is any different? Your God cannot deliver you from Assyria. No God can. So surrender. Jerusalem, surrender. The challenge from the voices of the world remain basically the same, do they not? What rules the world is worldly power and might, the economy, politics, the daily rat race, the kingdoms of the world. That is what calls the shots. 
Your promises, your hope, your faith is a bunch of nonsense, wishful thinking, made up dreams, the world tells us. All religions are the same. Forget the religious poppycock. The world and its ways rule, not your God. So conform to the way the world thinks and works. So how does the story end? King Hezekiah and Jerusalem trusted in their God, Yahweh. King Hezekiah did one of the greatest things that I think is something we all need to do when we are besieged by Assyria or by pandemics. He brought the matter before God and prayed. He prayed saying, O Yahweh of hosts, O God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Yahweh, and hear, open your eyes, O Yahweh, and see, and hear all the words as an acronym, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Yahweh, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations in their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Yahweh, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kings of the earth may know that you alone are Yahweh. <clears throat> so then what happened? Do you know the rest of the story? The God of ancient Israel, the God of King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah was not just another run-of-a-mill God on the smorgasbord of ancient gods and goddesses. Yes, the kings of Assyria conquered other gods, for they were no gods, but simply statues of wood and stone. Big deal. Kings of Assyria conquered a bunch of statues, worthless idols. But now, now, they're facing the true God, the almighty creator who made the heavens and the earth. And the true God heard Hezekiah's prayer and acted in a mighty way. And as I read in the text, a fascinating thing took place, an act of deliverance. And the angel of Yahweh went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of Assyria. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead bodies. The mocking of the king of Assyria got him nowhere. It got him defeat. So what happened to this poor synacronym, this king of Assyria, who thought he was top dog of the world? He returned home and chained to Nineveh. And the text records, get this, that 20 years later, while he was worshiping in the house of his idol, his own sons, his own sons, struck him down with the sword, assassinated him. How ironic, how humorous. Sennacherib's own God could not even deliver him from being assassinated by his own sons. But the God of ancient Israel, the God of Hezekiah, and the true prophet Isaiah is not impotent. He is not a bunch of religious made-up mumble-jumble. He is the true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He acted upon his own promises. He carried them out. They were not empty words. God fulfills his promises. He came mighty to save his people, to save his Zion from the formidable Assyria. Jerusalem did not save herself. Her own might was no match to Assyria. Perhaps Shekhar was right about that. Jerusalem's salvation or deliverance was due only to her God and his faithfulness to his promise of deliverance and protection. Believe the promises of your God, the true God given by his ancient prophet Isaiah in this Advent season. The day of deliverance of Zion in 701 BC was just one of the greatest miracles recorded in Holy Scripture. That mighty act of salvation gave a foretaste, an anticipation, a preview, a down payment of the coming act of God save as frequently promised by Isaiah, the time when God will save from death itself, from sin itself, from all the might of the world to oppress and rule. This Advent season, we look forward to the future day of salvation, especially as we are besieged by the Assyrian pandemic of COVID-19. In fact, that future day of salvation, of deliverance has already entered into the history ahead of time, through Jesus of Nazareth, God's saving work already took place. The death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ assures us that the victory is in our hands. 
that despite when we look around and we see Assyria telling us to surrender, God encourages us to stay faithful. God promises victory. Jesus said, as in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He has already saved us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. He did it by living a perfect life in our place and offering himself up as our substitute. He did it by willingly allowing himself to be crucified and put to death by the world. He saved us from all sins, from death, from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that we might be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Yes, as Christ suspended on that cross, he too was mocked by what you might call the Syrians, people making fun of him, people telling him, if you are the Christ, get yourself down from the cross. But Jesus is the Christ, and because he is the Christ, he stays on the cross to do the job of the Christ, to save us, to save the world. Even though things may be dark in his world on the cross, he knew that his father was going to bring deliverance to the world through his death and resurrection. So through our faith in Jesus Christ, we do not, long, we do not belong to the world. Um, we belong to Christ. As he has risen from the dead and lives to all eternity, Jesus is the victorious Lord over all. And so he now gives you a share in his victory. Here in his new and greater Zion, in his new and greater Jerusalem, he gathers you into his saving presence and gives you the blessings of salvation for the means of grace. As the epistle lesson for Sunday stated, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. He did it through holy baptism. He does it through the gospel proclamation. He does it through the Lord's Supper. Here in Zion, among his people in his presence, he gives salvation. And this gift now is the guarantee that one day Jesus will come again in visible glory to save you on the last day. Believe the true faith you were taught. Don't surrender to the voices of the world, no matter how dark it may look surrounding your city. By the power of the Holy Spirit, trust in the promises from the true God spoken by Isaiah, his prophet of old. The true God will come mightily to save. Trust in God's promises as they were fulfilled by Jesus of Nazareth, God's own son in the flesh. Trust in God's promises that one day, all promises of God will reach their consummation when the Lord returns in visible glory. Yahweh will save his Zion. You can count on it. God is always faithful to his promises of deliverance. In his name, amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you for joining us for this evening devotion. We hope that uh, you were spiritually enriched in your faith tonight as we await the deliverance of this mighty God who, come, who will come in visible glory to deliver his Zion. God bless you. We will see you Saturday night at 7 o'clock.